there's Aaron, sorry. Six. All right, raise your hand if you can hear me. All right. All right, so uh, hold on, I'm just gonna scream at Don to start this. So while I'm not public media, I was looking at that. Longmont Public Media, we are ready. <laughs> awesome, great. And let's go ahead. I would now like to call the March 31st, 2020 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Tonight's meeting is different because of the novel uh, COVID-19 virus. Thus, we are holding the meeting remotely. Let's go ahead and start with a roll call. Mayor Bagley. Here. Council Members Christensen. Here. Hidalgo Faring. Here. Martin. You're muted, Marsha. You just muted. Peck. Here. Rodriguez. Here. Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a full quorum. All right, let's go ahead and start with the pledge. You can stand and we're going to say the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, under God, liberty, and justice for all. All right. All right. In order to provide public comment during the stay at home order, uh, residents provided public comments prior to the meeting by submitting them in writing or via video or phone message. I hear we have some very interesting comments. Comments are limited to three minutes per person and those submitted prior to 5 p.m. will be read into the record by staff. So we have those. Also item 90 regarding wastewater revenue refunding bonds also has unique instructions for how to publicly comment on this item during the public hearing. For federal requirements, real-time public comment will be allowed for this item only. Residents wishing to speak during the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-12 should watch the live stream via the city's YouTube channel at, and I'll repeat this twice, https colon forward slash forward slash www.youtube.com forward slash c forward slash city of Longmont forward slash live then call 303-651-8647. Um, again, uh, www.youtube.com forward slash C forward slash City of Longmont forward slash live at 303-651-8647. So at this time, I introduced this item and I opened the public hearing. Um, this is gonna be available for this item only due to system limitations. So we're gonna go ahead and wait 60 seconds. See if anybody calls in the public hearing on this matter. Mayor, if I may, when we, we will use that process when we get to 9A. And do that then? Yeah, we'll help us put that number on the screen if anybody wants All right. to. Per perfect. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and do we have a motion for approving the minutes of February 25th, 2020, the regular session? Uh, Councilmember Peck? You're, you're muted. So moved. All right. Do we have a second? Is that council member, was that council member uh, uh, Christensen that I saw raise her hand? Yeah, second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right. The motion passes unanimously. 3B, uh, approval of minutes to the March 17th, 2020 regular session. Do we have a motion? Um, so moved. All right. Second. All right. So it's been moved and seconded. Let's vote. I mean, I'm assuming there's no further. I don't see any hands. So all in favor, say aye. 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 All, all opposed, say nay. Unanimously. All right. Let's move on to agenda. And submission of documents and motions to direct the city manager to add agenda items to future agendas. Um, I know that council member, uh, uh, Lizzie, do you have something you'd like to bring up, council member Peck? Yes, I do actually. Um, it's going to be a statement and then maybe a motion, uh, but we'll see. Hold on one second. We're going to go you, Dr. Waters, and then council member, uh, Hidalgo Faring. 
Um, this is to our residents and our small businesses. Um, as you know, that we had a $2 trillion uh, coronavirus aid package that went out Monday, um, actually yesterday. And of that, $377 billion are for small businesses under 500 employees. Um, I am stating this so that our small businesses know that our council is on top of this and our city is as well. $60 billion are to individuals for rent and mortgage help. Uh, $339.8 billion is for state and local businesses. And my message to our residents and small businesses is that you need to start your applications for these dollars now. The applications have not been accepted yet because that window has not been open, opened. But when it does, it's a very short window and it's going to be first come, first served. Um, and those dollars are going to go out pretty darn fast. Um, hold on. Oh, uh, the city staff, and I think that our city manager is actually going to address this as well, is trying to figure out how in Longmont we're going to do that. LEDP will be a part of that as well as uh, the chambers might be involved and our city staff. Um, the Longmont uh, come through the Small Business Association, along, uh, but along with some of the obvious businesses that can apply, we have hotels and contractors self-employed who file their taxes on a 1099 form. Restaurant owners uh, having more than one location, they're going to need to submit an application for each, for each site, not putting all their restaurants under one application. Um, these are just some of the things that I've learned about this so that we can get a, get a real fast move on it. Um, there is an, a component in this act to, uh, about lost revenue from businesses. So, uh, if the, what I am asking um, our small businesses to do is go out and read this bill for yourself. And to, here's where you can read, you can find it. Hopefully everybody can see this. It's congress.gov and you search for S. Dot three thirty five forty eight CARES Act, and if you want to know what's inside the Senate's two trillion dollar coronavirus aid package, go to npr.org. They do a really nice breakdown for it. So there are a couple of things I would like uh, to direct staff to do if they are already not doing it, and one of them is to have on the website, hopefully under Engage Longmont a list of the banks in Longmont that actually deal with SBA loans, because not all of them do. Um, the other thing is if we could work with, uh, hopefully with somebody from SBA, from one of these banks, if they could do a very short tutor tutorial to walk small business owners through this process, that would be greatly, in, uh, I think it would be, a needed in order to help people fill these applications out correctly. So um, I'm going to move to direct staff um, to, on our website, put a list of the banks in Longmont that actually work with FDA loans. Um, is anyone? Second. Okay, uh, and Harold, if you wanna chime in, are we already doing this? Have we addressed it? Make it clear for our uh, businesses? Well, I don't hear from Harold, so. Um... Harold, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, Joan, Joan asked if, what, what, the, what there's a motion on the table to basically instruct <clears throat> staff to put the uh, business and banks on the city website that are working with the SBA, as well as other information to facilitate small business uh, applications to uh, I lost your, I lost your audio. Um, again, so there's a motion on the table it was moved by Councilmember Pack, and I believe it was seconded by Councilmember Christensen to direct staff 
to put a list of the banks on the website, Lamont, the city of Longmont website. Uh, those banks were working with the SBA that small businesses could work with to access those loans and grants, as well as other information about uh, facilitating uh, the $2 trillion aid. Yeah, so um, doing right now. Let, let me get with that. We're building a business portal um, that we're gonna add more information to. If you look at that, I know in terms of the tutorial video, uh, the SBDC has a tutorial video on this now, and we're po pointing folks to that location in terms of the loans that they're doing. Um, Good. So, and I know we had the link. We're linking into, we're telling folks to link into the LADP, and then they can see some components we have, which then links into the SBDC. We're trying to streamline that process right now, so it's one move. So, uh, Harold, if there are businesses that are working with their own attorneys, if they go to congress.gov CARES Act, um, they can probably do that on their own. And the reason that I am escalating this is that window to apply is going to be very short. And Correct. I don't want our businesses missing out on it because they can't find where to go or the right information. So, um, would you have any problem putting that to read the entire bill? Uh, so they can search for components and see where they where they land in their this whole act. It, it, what we're trying to do, and I, I was going to cover some of this in my update, is that oh, what they've okay. done, and I can go into it later. But what they've done is they've identified the pot of money. Now the question's really coming into who's going to administer it, and what are the requirements going to be associated with that, and that's what they haven't released yet. Um, okay. We do have several staff members watching that and working on it and and trying to anticipate what's going to happen. And I can cover that a little bit more in my report. Okay, then do you, uh, I guess I will um, retract my motion because it sounds like you're already on top of it. So I can pull that back. All right, so Council Member Peck's retracted her motion, but <laughs> a great idea, Joan. Thank it's you. a great idea. And Harold, uh, good job. Well, let's get that up as quick as we can once we have uh, access to money so on the applications. Can I can I make one more point? Yes, uh, you can. Because, because this act also uh, addresses individual loans or individual dollars for individual or for people um, as far as rent, uh, help with rent, help with unemployment insurance, et cetera. Uh, I would like some confirmation that this website will also address that for individuals. So um, we're going to have two components to this, and uh, we'll talk a, a little bit about some questions I'm going to have for you in the report. Um, we're going to have a business assistance section and an individual assistance section that deals with uh, the differing issues. Perfect. Thank you, Harold. Thanks. All right. Um, all right, uh, I believe that uh, I said that uh, Dr. Waters, you were next. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, I think we all received from um, Jeff Cahoon, Boulder Area Labor Council, uh, some correspondence regarding a, a coalition of uh, organized labor groups, nonprofits, uh, uh, advocate groups uh, who, are, who are addressing some of the the consequences and the needs of working families uh, in this time. And uh, in correspondence with Jeff, Jeff uh, forwarded a, a resolution uh, reflecting uh, both the, the, some of the needs and, and a platform for policy options in a half a dozen areas. And I, I don't know that the given the given the, the context in which we're working and the time frame for this, I don't know that the resolution is is, is the thing to do. I, I would like, if you haven't seen Jeff's resolution or his correspondence to take a look at it. What I would like to do is if there's a majority of this, the, the council that agree with this, give staff direction to at least draft correspondence uh, that the mayor and city manager, manager could sign to the governor and to our legislative delegation from uh, re representing Longmont uh, that addresses both the needs and the and the proposals in the half a dozen areas in this in the, on this platform. 
to express our support, officially express our support for working families and uh, need for sick, paid sick days of housing affordability, economic security, housing protection, workplace health and safety, et cetera. Uh, Harold has a copy of the of the resolution, so the, the content is not a mystery. And um, uh, if we don't worry about a resolution, at least get on the record with the governor and our legislative delegation, our commitment to the to the platform in these areas. So I'll be quiet and see if I'll, I'm going to make that motion and then see if anybody wants to, to second. I'll second it. I'll second it. Yeah. It's been, it's been moved and seconded. The, uh, uh, do you have any comments? In addition or debate? All right, let's go ahead and take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, that motion passes unanimously. All right, is that it? You, you, want, you still want the four doc or no? All right, Council Member Doggle Faring. Okay, so I have a couple of things. One is a motion to direct staff. Another one is um, requesting an update from Don. She already knows uh, what what this is pertaining to, and um, yeah, and then just another statement I'd like to say. So the first thing is um, the public statement. I guess I'll start with Don. Can you give some highlights as to? Um, What's going to be happening? I believe it's in next week's agenda item in relation to home delivery for um, uh, home cannabis delivery and permit. So, in accordance with HB 19.1234 that passed last year? Definitely, Mayor Bagley, Council Member Doggle Faring. We plan to bring um, the updates that you previously directed us to bring for um, the publicly traded change that the green solution is asked for. So that is coming forth on April 7th uh, for your first draft operation. We'll also bring a couple uh, citation updates because statutes have changed a little bit. And I was at that time to ask you for direction if you'd like us to bring information back about providing delivery. Um, if you would like to give that direction tonight, we could certainly uh, take that direction. We wouldn't have it ready for you next week by any stretch of the imagination. We could get to work on that and bring you back information and some draft legislation in maybe in three weeks or four weeks, something like that. Mm -hmm. But it is on our radar. We just haven't gotten to it yet. So whatever you like. Okay. And then the motion that I would like to um, bring forward, if there's an interest in this, and I, I really hope that there is, um, but to direct staff to bring forward a statement or a letter that the council uniformly supports uh, and adheres to the recommendations by the World Health Organization, the Center for D Disease Control, uh, the Colorado um, and Boulder County Departments um, of Public Health and Environment, um, that we agree to the recommendations and orders of Governor Polis of the state of Colorado. And additionally, a statement that any viewpoint we make on the contrary uh, is solely our own opinion. And, you know, I know that, you know that, but we need to make sure that the public as a whole knows that when we are making statements, out there, it's not a, um, a reflection of what the council believes as a whole or the city of Longmont. And so to have that cohesive statement, um, I would like to. I would second that. Second. I would second that, oh, third. We have, we have a motion on the table um, from uh, council members, uh, Yago Faring, that we uh, have a direct staff to draft a resolution stating that we will follow the CDC, um, Boulder County, Governor Polis, and the WHO mm -hmm. when they are offering uh, advice. Um, we have other, and then that was seconded by Councilmember Peck, right, Councilmember? Uh, Christensen. Was it Councilmember Christensen? My apologies, I couldn't see you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilmember Peck. Um, thank you. I think this is a good idea to give some confidence to the public in their leadership. Um, the other thing that I would like in that statement is to remind people that council voted unanimously to ratify uh, 
basically giving our city managers and staff um, control over and joining and accepting what all these organizations decide to do. So it is up to the city managers to run our city. And we have with that unanimous ratification given them that power. So, so I would like that also to be mentioned. However, you can draft that in the letter. Councilor Christensen. Excuse me, it would be a letter to our residents. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Council Member Christensen. <laughs> Um, yes, I think this is uh, really important to do because we need to speak. We set the policy in the city and we need to be unified in a, one voice in what that policy is, regardless of what our personal opinions may be. And when we speak as a council, we need to speak as one voice because this is a, an emergency time and we need to back um, all of the emergency orders. Thank you. Hold on one second, guys. Yeah, I can do that. Yep, I got it. Got it. I was told that I'm getting some feedback from my mic. I'll mute when I go off. Just trying to help you, but that's why. That's all right. I'll, I'll, I will. I will stop. All right. Other other comments. I have one more thing I wanted yep. to, uh, in regard to this um, statement. Yep. This oh, right here. All right, so I guess I, I, won't, I mean, it's no secret. I think you guys are all being very, 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 very polite. I appreciate that. It's no, it's no secret that the motion was made as a result of the comments I made this week. My only concern, so again, um, and right now everyone's rolling their eyes. Oh my gosh, Bagley's going off. You know, oh my God, not you guys, but people watching from home. Oh my gosh, Bagley's not going to support. My, part, of my, part of my frustration that I think people heard was that as I'm listening, um, to Michael Hancock, the mayor of Boulder, the Metro mayor's folks, as I'm listening to the epidemiologists, our city staff is listening to Governor Paul. Sometimes the WHO, Boulder County, the governor, and, and others are in conflict. One, one of, part of my frustration is that, uh, and I know I see people rolling their eyes, but they are, um, part of my frustration last time um, was I got, I had literally just before our Thursday meeting, I got off a call with Michael Hancock and the mayors. And there were two conflicting orders. Um, I was notified by the mayor's staff, quote, um, Michael Hancock at this meeting is going to be uh, uh, providing the leadership that our governor is failing to provide. Michael Hancock came out with an April 17th deadline. Governor Polis came out with a uh, an April 11th deadline. Um, part of my frustration was that Boulder County jumped on with Michael Hancock. I believe 100% we should follow the lead of our governor. That's it. So if you were to actually sum up all my comments and all the people are upset with me, right? It's we should follow our, our governor. It's not New York. It's not Italy. It's not South Korea. Experts right now that are advising him he should be the one calling the shots. So I would like to see a motion. Mayor, I can't hear you. Your audio has gone. All right. Yeah. Okay. You're muted now. All right. Is that better? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you now. So. So I don't know where I cut off. Where did I cut off? I don't want to repeat myself and waste time. You had mentioned that you would like to see a motion. And oh, yes. So, so the motion, what I would like to see is a motion stating, stating that we unequivocally support our governor. He's got, he's the one who is leading the state. He is the one, not Mayor Hancock, not me, not even the Boulder. I, I don't even think that Boulder County commissioners or the health department should be leading. I think we should be following Governor Polis. If he says go to April 30th, we'll go. If he says go to June, we'll go. But my, my frustration is other political leaders are providing leadership with, with conflicting orders. It's frustrating. And so what you saw on Thursday was a result of me coming to that meeting. So I'd like I, that's what I'd like to do. Councilmember Peck. 
So, uh, Mayor Bagley, uh, I agree with you, but is that not what our unanimous vote to ratify Governor Polis's stand, uh, giving that permission to our city managers? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that that's what that unanimous vote was for. No, well, no. So the unanimous vote was we were going. We we gave Harold, sorry, Mr. Dominguez, uh, absolute power in this. Uh, he's got emergency to call the shots during this time. So okay. every day is working his butt off doing what's best. If he decides, if Harold decides that we need to fight, follow Boulder County or we need to do something, we listen to Harold, right? Right. But but if the WHO, Boulder County, and the Metro mayors and the CDC are all giving different directions, different dates, different whatever, I think we should follow the governor. If there's a conflict, I want to follow Polis. That that is that has been my stance both on the phone with the Metro mayors as well as you know during my my seemingly rants, so to speak. So um, if in conflict, I want to say let's. Governor Christensen, I'm going to meet myself. Sorry, it takes me a while to find it. Um, okay, I here's my problem. We're all, everyone in the United States and all over the world is frustrated. Everybody's worried. Those are legitimate things. I want people to listen to doctors and nurses and scientists, not politicians. Governor Polis is listening to World Health Organization and CDC. And because this is evolving so rapidly and things are changing all over the world, which is always the case with the pandemic, um, that's who we need to have faith in. And the governor, the governor, you're right, the governor is listening to these, and that's why we should follow the governor. But the best people to follow are the scientists and doctors and nurses who are on the front lines and really know what's going on here. We're not going to be able to accumulate uh, perfect data. There's no such thing, actually, as perfect data. But, you know, it's um, this is not a time to be obsessed with data because <laughs> It's changing from hour to hour. So I would, although I agree with you, Mayor Bagley, that we need to listen to uh, Governor Polis. And the reason we need to listen to him is because he's listening to scientists and doctors and nurses and medical people on the front lines. So that's all I have to say for right now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. I appreciate the <clears throat> the intent of uh, Council Member Hidalgo Faring's motion, um, but I also recognize from the WHO, CDC, and and um, uh, others, we could get you could get conflicting uh, recommendations in terms of timelines and, and protocols. So, uh, assuming that the governor continues to take his his lead from uh, from CDC. Uh, I think the idea of, first of all, I like the idea of a, of a statement, and I'm going to vote for that. But I also think we ought to be clear I, I, to, it, it, to, to, to follow three different groups that might have different recommendations is, is not going to be a good idea because we're going to have you know, conflicting proposals. So um, I appreciate Council Member Christian's statement about science. I agree, science ought to lead, but somebody's got to call the shot in the state in terms of what the regulations are, and I and I and I agree. I think it ought to be the governor, and I, and if the motion is to support whatever the governor's order is, I'm going to vote for it. Would you accept, uh, Councilmember Yago Farring? Would you accept the friendly amendment that basically says, when in conflict, we follow Governor Polis? Um, I'll accept that as a friendly amendment. I will. Cool. He's proven to, to get his information and follow his lead based on what the scientists and doctors have been saying. So I, I do, I trust him. I could, I could wholeheartedly support that motion. So, anybody else? All right, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Okay. okay.
And I have one I, statement I wanted to. Polly's next. Okay, go ahead. Is Susie. That right? Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, so really, it's just, and I want to put this out to everybody. Um, over the last few weeks, I've assisted quite a few people in crisis, um, including own, my own family members. And it, one thing I want to extend, and one thing, you know, we are under a lot of stress, not just personally, professionally, but what the work we're doing on council as well. And this isn't an attempt to bash anyone or demean anyone, but really coming from my heart. I'm, you know, I'm worried about Mayor Bagley. I'm worried about you. <laughs> and, you know, I want to find a way to support you. And if you feel the need to take a break, you know, we have provisions in our charter that would allow Mayor Pro Tem to step up and take care of your health. You cannot be a support to anybody if you are not taking care of yourself. And I've learned that the hard way over the years. And sometimes you do need to take a step back. And I would wholeheartedly support you in whatever decision you make. And, and the same goes to any one of us. When we start feeling like I, I'm doing my first week of online learning and oh my gosh, my hair is on fire. So I may need to take you guys up on that as well a week or two from now. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. Take care of yourself. All of you. So, you know, each other. Council, Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I don't think that that's a helpful statement. I deplore Mayor Bagley's angry remarks but i think our job as council members is to show solidarity as a body and the idea that a council member is going to publicly um express a lack of comp confidence in his competence is a different thing than deploring the statement um, that he made i've made some unpopular statements in in my career on this council um some of them i stand by and some of them i regret mm -hmm. but i think that we need to recognize the difference between the function of an electric an elected body and uh its ability to lead um and our disagreements with one another so mm -hmm. if that's a if this is a resolution or something i'm not sure that nope. it is, but but I certainly disagree with the statement. Okay, so fair enough. Um, my point in being is that we need to, we are people and we need to look out for one another. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the sentiment. I wish that that sentiment would have been shared in private. Um, thank you, Councilman Martin, for your statement as well. Um, the, uh, I am perfectly well. Um, my uh, uh, my job as mayor, um, I've had a lot of comments. Half the people, based on my statement, half the people have called me championing, saying, good job, mayor. The other half are calling for my heads with swear words. And I'm sure we'll hear all the swear words tonight during public invited beer. My job as mayor is not to tell people to stay calm and to stay in their homes. My job as mayor is to look out for the long-term viability and health of Longmont. And the mistake I made, I made the mistake of suggesting we need to compare the hiding at home policy to the health and death impact on the world. That's it. And I have yet to hear anyone asking the question in any meeting about what are the health impacts going to be of shutting down the economy? It's a very loud time right now. All white noise, all white noise. Sometimes you have to raise your voice to get above the, the noise. I raised my voice. Um, uh, I am frustrated. I'm not angry. I'm not panicked. Um, I am just simply stating that just like we have a virus, that we need to make sure that we follow the orders of the governor and others, 
we need to start asking the question, how do we look forward to minimize the health impacts of shutting down our nation? That's it. And so people online and in person are starting to ask those questions as a result of me basically losing my stuff. And uh, I'm not going to resign. Interestingly, no one could anyway. I'm not going to resign. I don't need a break. I appreciate the concern. Um, the, uh, but uh, I would like to see as soon as possible dentists, mental health helpers, orthodontics, chiropractors. Uh, I, I would like to start seeing the world going again somehow. I'm not an expert. I'm not going to advocate that that happen. Um, but we should at least start seeing experts provide the answers to those questions. Because right now we are so focused on the virus. I understand why, but we are so focused on it, we are not asking any other questions about any other topic. That right there was my frustration. So um, uh, if I feel, rest assured, if I feel that the stress is too much, I will be the first person to turn it over to Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, who's perfectly capable of uh, chairing any meeting and acting as mayor of this town. So, all right, any other questions? Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, it's, this is kind of for what it's worth. Uh, on the on the other side of this uh, crisis we're in, uh, we're, we are going to need to be uh, as extraordinarily thoughtful and strategic in terms of how we rebuild both our local economy and the macro economy. So, for whatever it's worth, this, this afternoon I did sit in on a, I participated in a in a webinar offered by Strong Towns. Uh, uh, Minicozzi, um, urban planner, was the was the featured speaker. The topic today was kind of economic development 101. Two weeks from today, he's going to do a follow up webinar, and it and the and the topic that he's going to address is well, how do you develop what does sustainable development look like on the other side of this? How do you reinvest in your communities? Um, that don't carry with them the kind of liabilities that some of the development we've done over the last hundred years carries with it that we're paying the price for today. So if we're going to have this conversation, I think let's find a way to frame it in a conversation where we can be in together about what do we do, right? Or what are the range of options we ought to be considering on the far side of this, right? Um, we can, finger pointing, we're hand wringing, all that stuff is not going to be helpful. Um, the anxiety is, exists for all of us, but if we could, if we could at least find a framework or some expertise that would change the narrative for us, not the narrative, we could create a narrative about what are we going to commit to on the far side of this to reestablish our economy when we are, when we're able to do it in ways um, that that will be different and probably better than where we were before this. You know, we were visited by this by this crisis, but um, for my two cents. Um, we're, when we get when we get into that conversation, and we, in two weeks from, from today, we could be in a webinar together and spend some time talking about it on Tuesday night. What did we learn, and what other resources might we want to bring it to our attention as we think about how do we we reestablish ourselves on the far side of the crisis? So, I'm going to be on that webinar. If anybody, I'm happy to see, if no, if nobody else has seen it, I'm happy to send you the information. And if, if others of, of you want to be on it. At the same time, um, it, it might change our conversation about what does development look like when we're out of this. Thanks, Dr. Waters. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just in consideration of all the uh, commentary that's been going on so far, uh, in concern to the economic ramifications of the pandemic that we're going through at the moment. I just want to also reemphasize the good work that the Longmont Economic Development Partnership is doing to be a resource for our business owners throughout town and that to uh, for folks to please reach out to the LEDP if they are concerned because they are cataloging a large number of resources exactly for this issue as well as I'm sure coming up with strategies for the eventual reopening of the economy. And I was just wondering if uh, you know, with this whole conversation that we've had, if we've maybe strain off, straight off course a little bit from our agenda and maybe could get back on track. Thanks. All right, great. We're going to move on with the agenda. Thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. All right, City Manager's Report. Harold, you're up. 
Mayor, can you hear me? Can I get a thumbs up if you all can hear me? Good to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a, a, another update. In some ways, it'll sound very similar. I can't see your faces, so I'm gonna stop at points um, to answer some questions if you all have it, because um, I can't read my notes. Um, I, I need reading glasses. Um, what I'm gonna do is go with a general overview. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what that means from an operational impact, where we are on the finance piece, um, and then we're going to get into some hospital numbers. Dan Eman is on, so I will ask Dan to jump in on that. Dan, you might as well um, un um, put your camera on so you can jump in and get ready to move in that area. And then I want to focus on some business assistance and financial um, and individual assistance, and then I have a couple of questions for you all. Um, what I will say right now from an EOC component is um, we as staff are really, um, we've got multiple issues that we're dealing with um, or multiple uh, opportunities um, and challenges that we're dealing with. The first is we're really working our continuity of operations plan, which you will often hear us refer to as COOP. And what that's really doing is ensuring that we can get our operations um, in line. We are, we are moving through that and we're moving to the next level of planning. So we're making some very strategic decisions in terms of how we staff, who we staff, where they're located so that we can have the um, enough duplication that when we have critical services, we always have someone in there to um, ensure that we're moving forward and providing those services to our community. Um, in evaluating the public safety staffing issues, and what they're seeing, um, generally the reports that I'm getting is um, uh, we're, we're in a similar position that we were last Wednesday, things are moving along, um, call volumes are there. I am asking public safety department to um, look at some deeper data sets so we can get a sense of what's happening in the community. I get those on Monday, they look at it um, every week. My, my review of the data from last week, um, showed some consistency. We we did see call volumes drop. And then in terms of more significant issues, um, we're not seeing them at the same. It, it seems relatively stable at this point, but we're gonna monitor that on a weekly basis. Obviously, if things change fast, Mike will be in touch with me. Um, the one thing that we're really working in public safety is we're getting new guidance from the CDC in terms of how we work with um, individuals in our interactions, both from a fire and police standpoint um to to minimize the um the reduce the likelihood of exposure um dan and his team um, is also actively working with both of our local hospitals and the county hospitals in terms of surge planning and he can go into that a little bit later the biggest challenge that we continue to have and frankly everyone across the country is, is really ppe um i know we've um, received um some additional equipment via the national stockpile and that's coming in. Um, but it, again, that's a national, that's a national um, challenge that we're dealing with. In terms of the overall operational impact and what we're dealing with as an organization, I think we also have to realize that there's a lot of things that we do on a daily basis that we're, we're having to continue. We have to continue making sure that our water's flowing, that our electricity's going, our next light's going, we're serving trash. Obviously, we closed playgrounds, but we didn't close parks, um, so we have to manage that. We have to manage the restrooms in the parks. A lot of people go, well, why did you not close those? The reality is in evaluating what we've seen historically um, and the impact of closing those is we could have another health issue develop. And so at this point, we're doing that um, and we're doing it in a different way. We actually are probably at a 60 to 75 percent of our workforce is actually uh, working virtually, we're making decisions daily to increase that. But when you really look, we're really we've really narrowed it down to police officers, firefighters, public works, and a handful of us that have to come in and and really um, work within the office. And so a lot of it is virtual work that we're doing. Um, the big thing we're trying to really also work on right now is positive and and, and accurate information sharing. The one thing I will tell you, um, I think daily, Dan and I um, are are challenged with information that comes in that's not quite accurate, and we have to start chasing it down to really understand um, what we're hearing and, and and whether it's actually 
factually correct. Um, at the same time, you know, our finance department, um, it's interesting, I got to be on a team meeting. They're working through the audit that we have to do at this time. At the same time, they're working through the numbers that Jim provided to you um, and evaluating those to see are they still correct and how do we need to adjust those numbers as we look to the future. Um, we should be able to bring more clarity to that within the next week or two with some options that we're looking at. Um, and, and some of those options are going to be critical in terms of, of what we bring forward to you all, because the one thing that we know from a financial perspective is that when we come out of this, um, there's going to be expectations in terms of the services that we provide um, and how we provide those services. So we're trying to move through that in a really methodical way uh, so that we can ensure uh, when we come out of this that we can provide the services that we normally do um, and that our residents expect on a daily basis. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions regarding hospital numbers. Um, Dan, do you want to jump in and talk about what you're hearing? Since I think you got up to date information tonight. Sure, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go here. So, can you hear me, Harold? Are we good? Okay. So these these numbers are current as of four o'clock today. Uh, Colorado has two thousand nine hundred and sixty six positive cases. 509 hospitalizations and 69 deaths. In Boulder County, we have 107 cases, 32 hospitalizations, and unfortunately, today we were notified of our second death. Um, as you guys know, we have two hospitals in town, and they're both part of large systems, you know, the UC Health System and the Centura System. So we're fortunate in that way because they have access to their broader systems and they can access resources in that way. And not only do they plan in inner facility, they also plan with the other hospitals in the county. So there's five hospitals in our county. We're fortunate there too. And they also have a large planning coalition with the whole seven county region, which is Adams, Arapahoe, Boulder, Broomfield, Denver, Douglas, and Jeffco. So they all plan on this stuff together. And the, the good news in this scenario is this, is this idea isn't new to them. They actually have hospital licensing requirements that they plan for things like this. Um, it didn't sneak up on them. Uh, they, they are extremely prepared. So if there is some kind of surge issue, it's not from a lack of planning. It's not from a lack of knowing this is gonna happen. We talk to them every day. They've been great partners to us in a number of different ways. Um, generally, their census is low right now, and that's by design. You know, they've canceled all things like electric procedures. They're trying to keep their hospitals um, as empty as they can, so they can start doing things like clearing out floors for increased ICU space, you know, clearing out areas for um, negative pressure rooms. So they're doing all of that stuff now, anticipating a surge that's going to happen, depending on what model you look at, in the next two weeks, up to the next four weeks. But they have planned for this thing for, for a long time. And another little piece of this that I want to make sure you guys know about is we're talking to our clinics in town too, especially Salud and Hope Light, the clinics that are going to see the, the most vulnerable in our community. It's a really important piece that we keep connected with because they're probably going to see the impacts of this first as people look to seek care there that those two clinics don't necessarily have the capacity to deal with and they're already doing some, some triage things. Um, as far as needs go, Harold mentioned uh, PPE is a significant issue for them as well as us. They're already doing things that adjust the amount of PPE that they use, as are we. Um, testing capability is an issue that, that you all are aware of. They, they have the same issue. And of course, they're really trying to keep their staff healthy. They don't have any issues now, but that's a priority for them also. So I'd say in general, right now, things are, are good. Um, they are in this mode of really trying to plan for the surge that we all know is coming. How big it's going to be, we don't know, but we talk to them every day and we're going to assist them in any way we possibly can. And I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has on that or Harold can continue on with his update. Thanks, Dan. Councilmember Martin? And Councilmember Peck, you're next. Okay. Yeah, I have, have two questions. Um, the first one is a uh, fine case. Is that a positive test? Is it a physician's diagnosis without a test? 
What is it? That's a positive case. That is a test that has come back positive. Okay, so in other words, it's some fraction of the actual number of people who are have contracted the virus. Listen. That's correct. And we've, you know, we've heard estimates on that. Um, they, they're all over the board. The last one I heard is probably about 50 times that many have positive in our community, but there's really no, no way to tell. Yeah, so 55-0? Yes. Okay. Um, the other question that I have is about PPE. Um, we have people with um, stocks of non-sterile literal gloves. We have people who are making masks according to the FDA specifications, making gowns according to the FDA specifications. Our hospitals have said they can't use those things. Would it be possible to um, uh, compile a list or find out or give a general announcement of what types of, of uh, users of that equipment can use the homemade stuff or the non-sterile stuff so that the um, high-tech stuff can be routed to the hospitals? Yes, actually, thank you. That's an excellent question. That was something that we're literally talking about today is we're trying to get guidance from the public health entities on what, what would be appropriate for exactly what you're talking about and what would be appropriate for lower levels of masks that we might be able to get. So we're working on that um, right now, and we, we definitely will get that information out as soon as we can. Specifically to that, um, you know, when we talk about um, our staff members that are out in different capacities and not necessarily dealing directly with individuals, um, we're trying to get the, the question answered in terms of what do they need and can they use those types of supplies as we're moving forward. All right, thanks, Harold. Uh, Council Mark. Um, Dan just answered those questions I had, so thank you. Councilmember Christensen and then Dr. Waters, you're next. Um, thank you to both Harold and Dan. I, I think that those are the things that you've told us are very, very reassuring to the town. It helps people understand how many people on staff are working on this and how in touch everybody is with the hospitals, with national organizations um is there a I, I know that a lot of people really want to help and um um sewing masks is a very easy thing but uh, unless they are actually useful they uh it's kind of a waste of time however i think that on some level if people um go outside, it would be a good idea. Most other countries have had universal masking and um, this isn't to keep you from getting it because that isn't, isn't useful at all. It is to keep you from spreading it. But um, in that way, homemade masks might be good. You can wash them every day, things like that. But is there, where would you suggest, who, what person do you suggest people who are interested in sewing things to those um, spec FDA specifications uh, contact in the city. Shannon? I think for right now, we will try to put something out once we figure out um, and talking to public health, what venues those kind of masks would be most appropriate for. So I don't have an answer for you on exactly what those are right okay. now, but we are looking okay. into that today okay. and we'll get that information out as soon as we can to, to make sure people that want to help have an avenue to do that. Okay. I'm really touched by the number of people out there sewing up masks and stuff. You know, it's we I, I think this has brought out a lot of good community spirit. But I do thank you both for for uh, updating the entire town on what's going on locally. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Dan, thanks for the report. Um, you mentioned uh, what, where we are in terms of readiness and capacity in the hospitals. You also mentioned uh, anticipated surge. You didn't talk about timing. Are we at a place where we, we, they can anticipate if there's going to be a surge or anticipating there will be, not quite knowing the dimensions of it, when will that occur? When would we anticipate knowing um, our, our, our hospitals are really potentially in it uh, at that point. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And I think what what we're hearing a lot of is what model do you believe? And there's probably six or seven models out there. But as of today, um, public health has kind of given us two models that they're that they are using. And one is um, kind of shows a peak around the April 17th, 18th timeframe. And then the other one is the one that the governor used in his last press conference that has that that has that peak um, significantly later. I think it was more like in the May timeframe. And I know that is that's a big range. And they're trying to match up the actual cases on the where we are in that upslope on the curve with what the predicted numbers are based on other countries. So I think that's why there's such a big range. And we know it's coming because we know that the, the cases are starting to double quicker as opposed to every you know, week or 10 days. Now they're starting to double in the you know, five day range. So we know we're on the ups, upswing. It just depends on when that surge is going to hit, but we know it will. Just one one related question. Anticipating the surge, what is the? I know there's a the models also build in uh, the lag time between exposure, uh, symptoms, and 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 surge, right? Or hospitalization. Um, so, assuming that we stay the course with the kind of isolation that we've been practicing social distancing when would we begin to see the better we are how long after we get better at this do we see the effects or the benefits of social isolation and i'll mute myself yeah that's a great question too and the governor had some of that um some of those predictions on the slides that he put out and segmented into um how well social distancing would work, whether it would be 40%, 50% or 60%. Um, I don't remember those off the top of my head, but we could absolutely go grab those and um, get them out to you guys and put them in the, the minutes of the, of the meeting too. I think, I, think it was about a, I think it was about a week or two um, is what he talked about in his presentation. Okay. Can I continue? Uh, I, I believe that Mayor Pro Tem had a question. Do you want to go now, Aaron, or do you want to wait? Yeah, uh, just to thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just a quick question for Dan. Uh, when you talked about Centura and EC Health uh, sharing their resources amongst their, their larger networks, does that also uh, include possibly the transfer of patients in and out of communities? For instance, maybe some patients from a different community with less capacity being transferred here to Longmont? It absolutely does. That's that's part of their their planning process. Is they'll they'll try to balance out within their their system first before they try to work um, inside the county hospital to hospital, and then outside of that, they'll start working into that broader system. So they'll do that work first. And I think the the other thing that we need to talk about in terms of this issue is. Um, we have plans upon plans in terms of surge capacity, and if we need it, where would that occur? Dan and I have had conversations if we needed our facilities, if the surge was there. Um, there are many, many iterations of this as we start moving through it, depending on the situation. Um, and that's just part of how you build your emergency management plans. All right. Anybody else? Can I keep going? Yep, go ahead, Harold. All right, so um, the next thing that, and, and so what you're gonna see from this update is we're really working, and think of this as sh you know short-term, mid-term, and then long-term, very similar to how we approach the, the situation with the flood. Obviously, right now, we are, we are focused on the short-term, but we're already starting to think about, well, what does that midterm look like and how do we prepare ourselves for the long term in these conversations? Um, and as we're doing that, I think the one thing I want to say, and, and I think I said it last time and I want to say it again, is, is we really um, we hear a lot from folks um, in different sections and we really under um, we hope we understand the the anxiety and, and how folks feel in terms of this issue. Um, and, and to many of the points that you made earlier, um, we have folks that are concerned about their own situation. Um, many of our staff members have that same concern. 
Um, to give you an example, um, I do in Texas have a relative that is in ICU right now. Um, I have a mother who is in her 80s. And so I completely get that perspective. I also have relatives that have lost their jobs because of some of these things, and I completely get that perspective. Um, and the one thing that I want to say is that um, I would say unequivocally that the folks that work for the under organization get it, and um, we're trying to, to do as much as we can to tackle each one of these issues because that's our job, and, and we have to tackle those issues. Um, I said this to the group, we have uh, an amazing group of people here with a lot of talent and expertise, um, and they're skilled and they're trained um, in managing many types of crises. Um, they're handling the situation very well. I'm trying to do touch points with them to see how they're doing um, to make sure that we're moving forward. Um, but the, the thing that is at the forefront of all of our minds is let's do it today. Let's get plans for the future um, and make sure that we can position the organization in the community in the best way we possibly can. And, and how do we look at where do we want to be in the future and, and, and what does that look like to us? And what does it look like to the community? It's going to be different. Um, and I think we've got many challenges, but out of challenges comes opportunities. And so what they're also doing um, so we're working on it in multiple fronts. The analogy I use is it's like a multiple front battle that we're engaged in trying to deal with these issues. Um, there are the immediate issues. I've touched on a lot of those. Um, I really you know, want to talk about the business improvement aspect that many of you talked about and what we're trying to do. Um, and I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive in that. And I'm going to start off with uh, first saying um, and, I, and I've got to reiterate this again, as we have our core services and we have those things that our communities relying on and we have to ensure that we continue doing that. Um, I generally classify this as the community service function because most of this work tends to be um, embedded within Karen's area, but it's, you'll also hear us talk about it in terms of individual assistance, you know, within a week. Um, we've done a lot of work with our partners. Um, I know Hope's been actively involved in, in, in the work that they've been doing with the homeless community. We work collectively to figure out how we can get showers going. I know we're seeing about five individuals, um, I guess a period come in and that seems to be working well. We're partnering with, um, you know, City of Boulder and Boulder County and the CRC facility for homeless individuals that may be sick. Um, the thing that a lot of people don't realize that we're also working on is we also know from our experience from the flood that a lot of these programs that Congress is passing, um, there is a lot of different components to these programs that we have to be very careful with because whether it's a duplication of benefits, whether it's you can't get benefits if you're undocumented, all of these things start coming into play. And so they're also working with uh, the private foundations so that we can ensure that we were doing, we did the same thing we did during the flood uh, and making it, you know, finding a way to those that may not be able to take advantage of the federal funds, we have another outlet for them. The other thing that we've really started too is um, Carmen and many of our cultural brokers, um, we're really starting to work with them to make sure that we're getting our messages out um, via that network, we really learned a lot about that during the flood and there's a lot of anxiety related to those types of issues. And so we wanna make sure that we're ac accurately communicating to the entire community. Um, and equity is a big component of that. Um, today, we have programs where, you know, where we can provide housing assistance. Um, in addition to that, we're um, engaged in mediation with landlords and tenants. We're providing education to landlords um, and, and tenants about evictions. I know there's gonna be information going out tomorrow um, that really talks about that. So that's where we are on the individual assistance side. Um, now on the business assistance side, we have really started plugging away. Uh, there's a group, they have this conversation, Joni, um, Tony Marsh and Peter Gibbons are my staff people that are involved in that. 
They're also working with the LADP, DDA, uh, Visit Longmont, Chamber of Commerce, Latino Chamber of Commerce. Um, and now today we had a long conversation about really how do we expand it beyond those gr that group? Because we know there are a lot of businesses that aren't also affiliated with any of these groups. So we want to make sure that we're communicating to them. And so today, there's a lot of work being done by Workforce Boulder County and the SBDC uh, in the SBDC world in terms of loans um, and how does that stimulus funding tie, in, tie into that. And so we're pointing people into the LADP website so they can then get into the SBDC world. Um, we're having conversations about what opportunities they have within their structure to assist businesses that are in the DDA boundaries. Um, I know LEDP is also looking at how can we create an enterprise fund to help fund other businesses that are in the enterprise zone. Um, and then we're looking at repurposing money that we have for have for one type of grant to look at it in a broader assistance piece here. And the council said, one of the things that council said, and this is gonna be one of my questions to you all, as you said, we have some council contingency funds that can we utilize for this? We know we have CDBG dollars um, available to handle the individual assistance, but in terms of what we have on the business assistance side there at this point, um, there's not read a lot readily available. And they said, can city manager make a proposal on that? Because of what we have on the individual assistance side would be to repurpose that 30,000 to go into the business assistance category. Um, so that's my first question for council. Um, do you all agree with that proposal or disagree with that proposal? Harold, you're asking about you utilizing just contingency funds? 30,000 to be put into the business assistance category I'm because of the amount that we have in the individual assistance. I, I move that we put $30,000 the uh, council contingency fund into the business, what did you call it, Harold? Assistance program. Business assistance program. It's probably going to change names. A second. All right, it's been moved by myself, seconded by Dr. Waters, council efficiency. Um, as you may remember, last week I suggested we put that into help for housing for people who are going to be foreclosed on. Um, we have a lot of money coming from the federal government for business help, and I'm concerned that we're we're going to be spending money from council contingency funds for businesses rather than individuals. I'm just wondering about the wisdom of that because individuals are the ones who make up the business. They are the ones who produce the goods and the services. And if they don't have a roof over their heads, uh, the business isn't going to get very far. But um, I did say that I would go with what you suggested, Harold. So, um, so if I can, if I can answer that question, part of why we're saying it is because we we do have funds via. Um, health and human service funding, CDBG funding that are allocated for that purpose. Um, I'm going to get to a different set of questions related to additional uh, funding opportunities that we have um, in terms of how we look at this in the future. All right, there's a motion and a second. Um, Councilmember Martin. Martian muted. Keeps coming and going. Um, I wanted to understand, uh, you know, we have a number of measures in place to keep people from getting evicted, right? We're not doing evictions now. And um, uh, Barha, for example, is, is uh, producing plans to work with uh, for landlords to use to um, work out repayment plans with tenants. Um, so are, are we sure that we are going to need additional eviction support? I mean, it seems like it's too soon to tell. Uh, Harold, a question that I'd like to ask is, 
is that if we find if we if we allocate to a certain uh, fund now, and then we find out that we have uh, anticipated incorrectly for these different emergency funds, are we gonna be able to move money from one to another or is it stuck there if we guess wrong? I think if I have the ability to move it based on the need, um, I can. we can do that based on what we're seeing real time. Um, okay, and then if that's the case, is there a need to allocate it now? Is it a, a business confidence measure or, or what's the reason for doing it now? Um, because we need to have the ability to, to understand generally what the pool of money is that we have available. So today we only have $60,000 available for the business grants in terms of what we've already per funded. This mm -hmm. would actually just add $30,000 to it, which would bring that total to 90,000. Um, and so that gives us clarity in terms of what we're actually able to do. And the other emergency funds, do you, or I guess you said you're going to bring that back at a future date. Is this the yeah. lowest fund that that's why you want to help it first? Correct. And I think the, the issue that council has to keep in mind when we talk about the emergency funds is when Jim talked about the budget deficit that we're going to have because we have to, at the same time, manage our own internal financing structures so that we can cover the, the economic impact that we're gonna have from a reduction in sales tax. And so a lot of those funds that you're thinking about in terms of emergency funds, we're gonna need internally just to make sure that we can continue our operations on an ongoing basis. All right, let's go ahead and take a vote. If we don't see any other hands go up. All right, uh, the motion is to uh, uh, apply $30,000 from council contingency funds to the business assistance grant uh, pursuant to Harold's recommendation. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. And so the final point that I have to go over with you all, and this is touching on Council Member Christensen's question about what we can do um, in terms of the individual assistance category. Um, we know that there's going to be some additional CDBG funding going to entitlement communities of which we are one. Um, and we're still churning through this and to Council Member Peck's point, we want to move through quickly. Um, so, so we can have what we need in place. And, and so generally, um, if you if you think about the CDBG world, there's um, different components in terms of what you, you can and can't do, of which everything that we've talked about in terms of a business assistance and, a, um, and an individual assistance can qualify in different ways. Um, obviously, based on what our experience was with traditional CDBG funds and DR funds, you have low mod income requirements that you have to hit in this, but we need to get a plan churning and out for public comment. And so as we were talking about this um, in terms of, and this is not talking about how much we're going to allocate, it's just really what are, what can't we use it for? Um, and, and working that with staff, we really identified two components, business assistance and individual assistance. Uh, on the business assistance, you know, when we said, what are we really trying to look for? One is to prevent permanent closure, two, to reduce and eliminate layoffs, and three, is position businesses to resume full operations as soon as possible. Because as we talk about this, and as we're evaluating it, if, if people are churning through trying to keep people employed, and then you get into a moment to where then they need to mature, they need capital to try to do that. So on the business assistance side, that is the general parameters that we were talking about. On the individual assistance side, um, that's changing a little bit in the in this, well, not changing, there's other categories, but we're also looking at how do we, um, how do we keep people housed? The council member Christensen's component is we need to make sure we don't have people become unhoused in this. How do we keep individuals and families financially solvent? We don't want people to take a lot, huge leaps backwards. We want to really stabilize them during this period. And then many of the other things that you all have in your normal CDG 
CDBG plan in terms of, um, and you can see this tied into housing, rental assistance, um, and just how we help folks generally. The other component that's starting to come in that we're trying to look at is really from a housing authority component in terms of, again, ties to keeping people housed, but then there may be some other opportunities for funding for the housing authority that will, will tie to this. And so my question to council on this is in order for us to get this process started, do the, does this really seem like how you all would want us to look at this in terms of staff, in terms of the individual assistance and the business assistance? Um, we will then have to come back to you all and talk about how we load that funding into the, in terms of percentages go into each category, but we needed to start somewhere. All right, I see everyone nodding their heads. Does anyone not agree? Raise your hand if you don't agree. All right, you have council consensus unanimously, Harold, move forward. Okay. All right. If, um, that's all I have. I just wanna kind of lead end with this to say, are there any general questions or comments to me regarding the process we're going through and how we're operating? So I'll start there. Dr. Water? Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Um, maybe a, just a statement and then a question, Harold. Um, we, we get a lot, there's a lot of incoming email, as we all know, from uh, folks who are concerned about, uh, you know, what, what's, what's gonna happen. Um, and as they see the social safety, safety net kind of eroding. So I, I guess the, just a statement is, I hope people are listening tonight. I think we're recording this. And um, what you just shared, I, I think is a powerful testimony to what the city staff is doing to look across the range of needs in this community, both on the business and the and the individual human need side, in terms of housing and whatnot. Um, so, number one, um, I just want to say uh, a heads a thumbs up, kudos for the work you're all doing. I, I think it's just pretty extraordinary. Number two, what do you need from us? Right, uh, you you've talked about. You guys are, it's a full court press for you. We talked earlier tonight about making a clear statement from this council of both our support for what the city's doing, but our, but our support of what the governor has said and the need to, to stay disciplined in our, in our approach now in terms of social distancing and, and honoring the guidance that we've received from um, scientific health experts. What else do you need from us? So actually, we're going to start hitting you all with some things. And so one is, um, I know that Longmont Public Media via our contract has asked for statements. I think some of you all have chose to do that. Others, we're going to really want you all to do that to continue getting messages out to our community. Again, as you look at it in terms of short term, mid term, long term, short term is I'm going to keep reiterating this. Stay home if you don't need to go out. If you need to go out, make sure we're supporting our local businesses. Um, you, you know, I, I, I say this a lot. We're benefiting from it too in terms of our tax revenue um, and, and, and how that supports the organization. But if you don't need to go out, stay home. Um, you know, we, I will say that we had really good response from the community in many ways when we were unfortunately closing parks and doing things, but there were occasions where that wasn't as positive. And the one thing I would say is just help us really encourage um, the community to understand that um, when, when the individuals from the parks crews are out doing this work, I mean, they understand uh, the inconvenience that it causes, but we just want folks to um, abide by the orders that the governor has issued. Um, and we don't like it doing it doing that any more than they do, but you know we have to do it and just realize that these are people too um, when we have those interactions. But that's a big piece. Um, I think when I look at any type of challenge and we move forward, um, I tend to do a couple of things. One, I get I try to get focused on what do we need to do now to deal with the situation, but then look into the future to go, how can we position ourselves? in a stronger place than we were at the beginning. And I will take you all to the flood and go, if you look at us today and you look at us where we were, and granted, it's not the same situation. This is a much larger impact. We're stronger. 
um, out of every challenge, there's opportunity. Um, and so I try to balance a couple of things. Um, and you all helping with this and communicating this is, um, we know where we are today and we know what the concerns are. How do we turn this into where do we want to be in the future? And how do we move through this collectively? Again, it's going to sound a lot like it did Wednesday. We can only get through this collectively. And that means every one of the members of our organization, you all, and every member of our community. And frankly, at a much larger level, every member of the, you know, every resident of the state coming together as we do this. This is an unprecedented challenge. Um, but if we're good at one thing. We are all really good at taking these challenges head on and doing really well. And, and I have complete confidence that we can do that collectively. And so I think saying, you know, really that kind of message. Um, somebody asked me, they go, are you afraid? And I said, I am. And I said, but my, my job is to understand it and understand what we're dealing with. And then hopefully to the best of my ability, be fearless as we're doing this and and, and um, stay calm. And so I know a lot of people go, you're like really calm. And I think that's what I have to do for me. Um, and um, I just hope I'm providing what you all need in this. All right, Harold, I think we speak for everybody that you're doing a great job. So, uh, so far, the resolution to have you in charge uh, seems to be working well. So, uh, please continue, save us all, and, uh, and uh, you'll, you'll be well rewarded, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Thanks. All right. All right. Let's move on to the consent agenda. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and read it, Don, if you don't mind. It's right here. I'm just going to blaze through. Um, so, eight item 8A. Hey, Mayor. Yep, go ahead. No problem, but we need to do public invited. Ah, that's true. Sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't see you on here. So I didn't. So you can do the consent agenda now that I see you. Let's let's read out the again. We're going to be doing public invited to be heard. People were asked to submit their comments in writing. So uh, let's go for it. On, it's on you. Mayor, Mayor this Sandy, is Sandy. Sandy's going to read these. Mm -hmm. yes. Go ahead. Sandy Cedar. Assistant City Manager, uh, Joni and I are going to take some turns because there are quite a few. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read it as if the person is here. First one is from Lisa Miller from 1272 Hummingbird Circle. And here is the comment. I'm strongly urging Mr. Bagley and all city administrators to take this pandemic with the utmost seriousness, prioritizing health over money. We can get by without paying rent. We can get by in rice and beans, but we cannot get by with the hospitals and our community members dying in the hallway waiting for ventilators. I am attaching linear and logarithmic graphs that depict the start and the progress of the, in the Colorado and US. We need to stay home and we need non-essential businesses to remain closed to continue this progress. That requires support from city leadership, no more com comments in bad taste, no more making staff work in the memorial building when taxpayer dollars have been paid for laptops. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Next one comes from Stephen Grace, 658 St. Andrews Drive. It is disgusting that the mayor said such nonsense on the meeting, claiming the economic hardship from the social distancing and isolation of the closing of non-essential businesses, temporarily, mind you, is far worse than the pandemic. For someone who has an economic background, if that's even true, he is woefully ignorant on it by disregarding experts in epidemiology and medical professionals that will cause a bigger burden on the economy if enough people get sick, they won't work either way. And if they do work when they're sick, they can infect others and cause a way worse economic downturn if we follow that advice. Governor Polis has shown his in his briefings that social distancing and stay-at-home orders are starting to show the flattening of the curve. Even in the Bay Area, and California is showing that this is working to slow the spread. Mayor, uh, heed your comments that you have made. It makes Longmont look terrible. I suggest that you read some science books on epidemiology, pathogens, general medicine because you're showing the ignorance of a sign as we, of a weak leader and one who does not base their decisions and comments on data, but how they feel in the heat of the moment. I suggest you take a 14 day self isolation vacation and disconnect yourself from internet TV and read a science book. The next person is Anthony Ingram. Anthony is 1757 Drake Street. 
We are in an existential crisis on a global scale, and we need strong leadership to navigate through this. Our leaders need to ensure that they take a level of ed an educated approach to their actions and not allow their personal issues to cloud their judgment. All the members of the city council should reflect on their personal boundaries. Mayor Bagley's recent outburst was an excellent example of personal issues having a negative effect on someone's judgment and decision making. If any members feel unable to execute their duties in a fair, level-headed and objective manner, they should consider taking a leave of absence or resigning. Poor leadership in a time of crisis like this will result in long-term community damage, erosion of the institution you represent, and most importantly, lives lost needlessly. There is no easy or painless solution, but we should be educating ourselves as much as possible and prioritizing human lives above all else. Thank you. Next one is from Brittany Scaife, 1522 Lincoln Street in Longmont. Regarding Mayor Bagley's fit in my mouth comment, being newish to the community, my impression is that Bagley was in the middle of the road. He can be charismatic. There have been many city council meetings where I cringe at flippant remarks. This takes the cake. I even voted for Bagley in the last election. Who on me for not having learned about his character prior to voting or for him needing a pandemic to show his true colors? I've been here almost a year in Love Longmont. One of my goals when moving here was to strive to shop local businesses whenever possible. I love so many of the local shops, restaurants, breweries, and I want them to be around after COVID-19. Hopefully fizzles out. But my message is that I will love and support these businesses through the pandemic without downplaying the severity of the situation and without putting myself at unnecessary risk. What a complete bummer to be served by someone who is so tone deaf and thinks it's okay and defensible to speak the way that he does even in jest. I don't want these businesses to close or people to be out of jobs, but I would also like to curb the pandemic and that's my priority. Mayor Bagley, I ask that you be more thoughtful in your language and reactions regarding COVID-19. You are in a position of power and influence and your jokes and sarcasm have real impact the next one is from Chris Hickman, 1225 Ken Pratt Boulevard. While I understand the mayor's frustrations, his complaints and rants are meaningless unless he has a better idea that could both protect residents and the economy. Until he is willing to give us those ideas, maybe he can stop embarrassing Longmont, making us look like a hillbilly bumpkin for the rest of the world. If not, I know quite a few people who are willing to make his wish come true if he prefers. Next one is from Aaron Sorensen, 2130 Spencer Street. I'm utterly appalled at Mr. Bagley's comments regarding our current and shared experience. As this disease spreads and we begin to lose friends and family members, these inhumane comments reflect an outmoded and irredeemably cynical view of the world. If humanitarianism is the mark of decency, then the mayor has failed remarkably. I can only hope that we are presented better options than a libertarian Dunce, Bagley, or a stupid child, I can't remember his name, but you know who I'm talking about for our next election. Let's do better long month. Next one is from Camille Camilla Wilson, 4202 Da Vinci Drive, long month. I was disappointed to hear of the attitude recently displayed by the mayor with regard to COVID 19 outbreak and restrictions we are all asked to be, to all being asked to live by. It is obvious he did not literally mean that he wanted someone to infect him, but the cavalier attitude, sarcasm, and negativity towards public health officials is simply uncalled for and immature. Our city is better than that. Our citizens deserve respectful, responsible leadership. We are all concerned and struggling with an unknown at this time, and we all have human fault. I get that, and I can forgive a mayor for saying something he didn't potentially mean. This is the reason I became even more concerned that he defended his comments when challenged rather than humbly recognizing his attitude as being irresponsible. To double down on those statements is dangerous and just plain wrong, and I think he owes the community a public apology. An apology to all of us who are stressed, worried, and concerned about the city's financial health and physical and mental health of its residents. I try every day to be respectful and humble and admit my mistakes, modeling the behavior I want for the next generation to have, and I would at least expect that much from my elected officials. Next one is from Julie Steenberg, 1112 Collier Street, Vermont. Comment is directed towards the mayor. Your cavalier attitude towards the lives of our constituents will not be forgotten come re election time. You should be recalled immediately. The fact that you are more worried about the bottom line than lives will not be, will be remembered. I, for one, will be screaming it from the rooftops, and I know that I will not be alone. Your comments will continue and we will not forget. 
one through 10. So Joni's going to take it from this point. Um, Mayor and Council, uh, starting with the next comment from Eric Johnson at 1526 Cedarwood Drive. The mayor is irresponsible and does not understand the current problem of coronavirus. You may well have said, let them all die. My mother is in that group of highly vulnerable people. She has been courageously fighting cancer for two long years. So should we just let her die so your business can keep going without responding to a global pandemic? I certainly won't be voting for you in the next election. Adios. Um, next is Jesse Walsh at 413 Cleveland, Loveland, Colorado. You made it clear the economy is more important to you than the lives of Colorado citizens. You're a fast talker and you talked your way into a conundrum. The people will remember these comments of yours and you will never be reelected. Therefore, the only thing for you to do is to resign immediately. Next is Matthew Hale, 1475 Clover Creek Drive in Longmont. Mayor Bagley should be ashamed of his comments. This is a man supposed to lead us through a crisis. I think you should travel to New York City, Chicago, New Orleans, or Detroit and let to Detroit. You are a pathetic person and it's sad that you're a leader in this wonderful community. Next, Adam Isaacs, 4734 Portofino Drive in Longmont. The mayor's comments were disturbing and horrifying in times such as these. He should be removed from his position for a lack of ability to lead the community. He is not an epidemiologist. He is not a doctor, and he does not even seem to be informed on a basic level. 0.05% of 1% of us will die. He is so far from the truth that I wonder if he's living in the same world as us. I am expressing my true and utter distaste for his handling of the situation. Um, next is Zach Turner at 316 Baker Street in Longmont. Mayor Bagley's recent remarks at a city council meeting regarding his opinion that COVID-19 should not require a quarantine because it's a disease that kills 0.05 of 1% of us should not be put above the economy. First of all, his figures are simply incorrect. The mortality rate is closer to 1%. 1% mortality would mean that a thousand lung monsters dead. Are you prepared to tell the city that the economy is more important than a thousand residents? Secondly, his callous remark that I want someone to come and spit in my mouth so I can go to the hospital now because I'm not going to die demonstrates a fundamental lack of understanding of public health and shows the mayor um, puts the economy above the well-being of residents of the Longmont. Um, Mayor Bagley, you deserve to be removed from office. If you continue with your magical thinking, you have shown that you refuse to uphold the office of the mayor um, for your failure to do so. Next is Gregory Hansen at 506 Tucson Street in Aurora, Colorado. I just watched the live stream from last night's council meeting. The mayor of Longmont has to be the most illiterate person I've ever met to claim businesses greater than saving lives is incorrect. I'm calling for the immediate removal. Making uninformed statements like his makes our entire state look bad. Next comment is from Brooke McElhenney, McClenney, who is at 2450 Airport Road. Apartment K 1107 here in Longmont. I desperately hope that our state government does not put economics above health and even life or death of its population. Please, please continue to enforce stay at home orders for this state. Please encourage people to cut down more on their trips out of the home. We understand that this is our way of fighting right now to shrink our daily lives in order to protect each other from this terrifying virus. You are meant to let and protect us. Please do not put the dollar ahead of life and safety. Next comment is from Jim Wise at 2195 Tularosa Lane in Longmont. I would like Mayor Bagley to answer why he believes that he is, knows more than the epidemiologists around the world who are advocating for the opposite of his position. Further, I would like him to convince me that our economy is worth more than a single one of my family members. 
And finally, I'd like him to know I have voted for him in every single election that he has ran for, and I will actively encourage votes in his opposition the next um, round. Um, what this situation demands in response is more than that. Next comment is from Jay Perez um, on Atwood Street. I, in here in Longmont, I am ashamed of our mayor and his recent behavior. I sure will not be voting for you next time. Not only were your comments unprofessional, but encouraged false information to the public and prioritized the economy over the lives of human beings. Your mask is gone, sir, and you showed how little you care and how much you care for the economy. Saying some 1% death rate is false, even the CDC says 3% minimum. Let's see, next up comment is from Willow McGinty at 518 Sierra Avenue here in Longmont. I am extremely disappointed in Mayor Brian Bagley's comments regarding the stay at home order. The stay at home order is not to protect you, Mr. Mayor. This order is to protect my family, my grandfather, my father, my sisters, and their children, all of whom live in your town. Um, do my family a favor and stay home. With that, I will pass it back to Sandy for the next 10. Thanks, Joni. So the next one is Julie Steenberg. Nope, oh, sorry, I already read that one. Uh, Eduardo Rodriguez. I don't live in Longmont, however, I do live in the great state of Colorado and have been here for most of my life. It's extremely disturbing to see the mayor of Longmont stoop to the intellectual levels of the president and also display meager leadership, especially in regards to COVID-19. Uh, the mayor's comments, uh, no, it, no one is doubting the economy will be impacted further. Everyone is already hurting economically and some health-wise. Do you have a background in public health? Um, a true leader listens, asks questions, and takes into account all input from everybody, but especially those smarter than them in their respective field. Why is it that most people critical of the severity of the virus are heavily concerned with people's health in the long term? It's already here, it's already affecting people's health, and it's already taking a life in Colorado. How are you going to worry about your health and your freedoms tomorrow if you are dead today? This, de this denial played out on a national level at the start of the year. I look where it has gotten us. We in the state of Colorado should be grateful. The mayor, Brian Bagley, should be grateful. And we hope that we do not see nor experience levels similar to other US cities, such as New York City. Effective leadership is one way to prevent it. Stay safe, residents of Longmont. Seth Myers, 219 Pratt Street. I'm really disappointed by the mayor's consideration uh, of the lives of his constituents in the video that has now gone viral to his defense of his position. I realize he is probably terrified that he's going to lose money as a result of this, but I want to be I want him to be a courageous leader who trusts science and places more value on human lives and on stock portfolio. I was at one with the last mayoral debates. Um, I was one at the last mayoral debates of Mayor Bagby Brand the edge Jerry Fullis's personal cell phone. Maybe he just didn't call him. And the next one is from Michael S. 945 Warren. Embarrassing. I just moved into Longmont last year and have been loving this city so far. The video is atrocious, so many things wrong with what was said. I'm not going to argue points here, but what was said is dangerous and very immature. I would expect from a mayor, more from a mayor of such a great city. I plan on making the city my home for a long time and would appreciate having someone who can have an open and mature discussion with everyone rather than climbing on a soapbox and ranting on and on. You want someone to come and spit in your mouth because you aren't going to die. Many people are getting sick and many have died. This is ignorant and disrespectful. Some people have compromised immune systems and medical issues that they did not choose. I'm glad you feel confidently in your ability to fight the virus. One is uh, Matthew Pajowski, 832 Lincoln Street. Mayor Bagley is a disgrace to the amazing city of Longmont. His statements at the last city council meeting show his ineptitude. He should resign immediately and go focus on his business that he obviously cares about more than the kind, hardworking, forward-thinking residents of Longmont. The next one is from Beth Denton, 1803 Emory Street. 
Mayor Bagley's comments about the stay-at-home order are irresponsible and inexcusable. Families like mine are relying on people to stay at home and flatten the curve so that high-risk individuals remain safe. Our health and our lives are not worth sacrificing for Longmont's economy on poor Mayor Bagley's political point scoring. Longmont deserves better leadership and a better example during this crisis. Next one is from Tamara Graff. 629 Stone, Stone Bridge. I was appalled to hear Mayor Brian Bagley's disregard for the public health protections put into place by the, when the orders to stay at home. I'm new to this community and so proud to be here, but was uh, not happy with his behavior. I will gladly be voting Mr. Bagley out of office as soon as possible. It's clear to me that the vitality of this business is a higher priority than the health and wellness of the entire community. Jim Keel, 459 Westview Court. Now there is a huge apartment complex off of Park Ridge Avenue that needs to cut out the buses which stop at the Walmart. Traffic currently has to violate the yellow line to enter oncoming traffic and get around the park buses. This endangers the driving public. This would be a valuable addition instead of spending our traffic dollars on roundabouts and dividers. Next one is from Lori Stanley. Ten fifteen Longs Peak Avenue. Members of City Council, thank you for your hard work during the coronavirus pandemic. I am writing to inquire about the status and review of your ADU requirements, specifically the setbacks as discussed in the City Council meeting in fall of 2019. Please know I realize that you have a lot to discuss re regarding coronavirus, and I'm respectful of your need to focus on this. However, this topic is important in the long run, and we do not want other households to be negatively impacted as 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 we have due to a lack of foresight regarding five foot setback. Okay, last one, Stanley Toll. 2137 Dexter Drive. When is the city going to end section eight housing discrimination in Longmont? Right now it's almost impossible for people with housing vouchers to obtain housing in Longmont due to landlords not accepting housing vouchers. The Longmont Housing Authority prints a list of landlords to call, but when the people find out that the landlords do not accept housing vouchers. Right now, most people with the housing vouchers in Longmont are losing their vouchers because they cannot find landlords who will accept housing vouchers. A lot of these people are senior citizens or people with disabilities. This is simply disgraceful that there are people that have to remain homeless because of this discrimination, particularly now when their lives are endangered by the COVID-19 virus. Was the last one? Ouch. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, let's take just a five minute break. Is that all right? Stretch your legs. And we'll just leave it running. Okay. Everybody mute. Thanks. Less than five.
Looks like we're just waiting on Joan and we'll get going. I'm here. I just had my video turned off. All right, let's go ahead and move on to consent agenda and introduction and reading by title of first reading of ordinances. Uh, Don Quintana, can you start with 8A and blaze through it, please? You bet. Ordinance 2017, a bill for an ordinance approving a farmland lease agreement between the city of Longmont and Site Farms LLC. On the double six ranch open space public hearing and second reading scheduled for April 14th, 2020. Ordinance 2020-18, 20 a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel H71, H72, and H73 to Best Steel LLC. Public hearing and second reading scheduled for April 14th, 2020. 8C is resolution 2020-28, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city acting by and through its water utility enterprise, East Cherry Creek Valley Water and Sanitation District acting on its own and on behalf of its East Cherry Creek Valley Water Activity Enterprise, Inc., Arapahoe County Water and Wastewater Authority, and United Water and Sanitation District for a short-term wa raw water exchange. Resolution 2020-29, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city of Longmont and Boulder County for the lease of the Boulder County Fairgrounds for Rhythm on the River. Resolution 2020-30, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the amendment to the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Longmont and the Colorado Department of Human Services Office of Behavioral Health for Contract Amendment Number 2 for a grant funding the co-responder program for Longmont Public Safety. And Resolution 2020-31, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and the State of Colorado for a state aviation grant for utility infrastructure at the Vance Brand Municipal Airport. All right, thank you. Do we have a motion to pass the consent agenda? I move passage to the consent agenda. I'll second. All right, that's moved by myself and was seconded by Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Seeing that no one has anything to pull, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed, aye. say nay. All right, that passes unanimously. Let's move on to ordinances and on second reading and public hearings on any matter. First, it's 9-8, Ordinance 2020. Oh. Brian, can't hear you. Uh, all right, hold on a second.
There's a ghost that keeps muting us. It's all right. I got, I'm going to try this. You guys hear me okay now? All right. I'm not hearing you guys though. All right. When I read, I'll just, I can't hear you guys. Can you hear? Can you hear? I can hear over here, but I can't hear over this. Hold on. It may be your input. Can you hear me now? Where? Can you hear? Test, test. All right, so I'll just read slow, okay? All right, 9A, Ordinance 2020-12, an ordinance authorizing the issuance of the City of Longmont Enterprise Wastewater Revenue Refunding Bonds, Series 2020. Uh, per federal requirements, real-time public comment will be allowed for this item only. Residents wishing to speak during the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-12 need to go to www.youtube.com forward slash C forward slash city of Longmont forward slash live and call 303-651-8647. Again, 303-651-8647. So we'll go ahead and wait uh, about 60 seconds to see if anybody calls in. All right, Don, we got anybody? Mayor, I do have a call, just a moment. Good, sounds good. Mayor, um, the caller is, our city attorney, Eugene May, Eugene May, verifying that this method works. So I'm just gonna put my phone so you can hear him. All right. Hey, Mayor, Eugene May here. I didn't call the police. Don, can you just go ahead and translate? Tell us what he's saying. We can't. He, he's saying he just, I can't put him on speaker all of a sudden. He's saying he's calling in to make sure that this method works. All right, so seeing that it worked and no one called other than our city attorney, um, let's go ask, are there any questions from council? All right, seeing none, uh, we're gonna go ahead and close the public hearing. Can I have one more moment? I had another miss, can I just try this other number? Sure. That just Absolutely. Eugene was on the line, just a moment. Yep. My apologies. Mayor, I have a someone for you. Go ahead and state your name for the record. Hi, Laura, I live at 804 Summer Hawk. Okay. Um, I just want to support Mayor Bagley for this comment because we cannot keep a fly in the room with a nuclear bomb. Thank you very much. Anyway, that didn't have, I don't know what he, she said, but uh, revenue bonds, correct? I, I don't think she had anything to say about the revenue bond, actually. Okay. All right. We'll move on. Then. No other calls and no other comments were received. All right. Cool. All right. Then let's go ahead and close the public invited to be heard. I'm sorry. No, we'll go ahead and clo close the uh, public hearing on this matter. Council Member Christensen. Um, okay. I'm looking here at the the debt service requirements of the city. And we have 54, pretty much 54 and a half million dollars. And uh, I guess I would like to hear from Jim Golden that he thinks this is 
I mean, I know we have to do this because we have to keep up our water system, but I'm really worried about doing this at this point of time. However, you know, if we wait to do this till next year, it'll just be more expensive. So uh, I guess I would like some comment by uh, the city manager or by Jim Golden. Jim, you gonna take it? Sure, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you, yeah. Jim. Okay, this is Jim Golden, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, Mayor Bagley, members of council, uh, this actually is a refinancing of an existing bond issue. This is not new money. So what we will be do accomplishing by doing this is uh, lowering the amount of debt service we're paying currently. Thank you, Jim. That's I forgot about that. Thank you for reminding me about that. That gives me a great deal more confidence. Thanks. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and vote. Do we have a motion? For nine I'll move. All right, I'll second it. All right, we have a motion on the floor to pass ordinance 2020-12 and ordinance authorizing the issuance of the city enterprise revenue refunding bond series 2020. Aye. 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 Opposed Aye. Say nay. All right, the, the motion passes unanimously. Item 9B, Ordinance 2020-13, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the City of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar, parcel H18, to Richard D. Sykes. Ms. Quintana, did we receive any written correspondence pertaining to the public hearing on this? Mayor, you, no, we did not receive any comments on this item. All right, then we'll go ahead and open and subsequently close the public hearing on ordinance 2020-13. Any questions or comments from council? All right, let's go ahead um, and ask for a motion. I'll move ordinance 2020-13. Second. Second. All right, that's been moved by Dr. Waters, seconded by council member Christensen. All in favor, say aye. 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 All, right, all opposed say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Ordinance 2020 uh, 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 item 9C, Ordinance 2020 14, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar, parcel H 18C to Zulu LLC. Are there any questions from council? All right, uh, Don Quintana, see any. Comments regarding public hearing on Ordinance 2020-14. No comments on this item either, Mayor. All right, then we'll go ahead and open the public hearing and close the public hearing on Ordinance 2020-14. Councilmember Peck. I move Ordinance 2020-14. Second. All right, that's been moved by Councilmember Peck, seconded by Councilmember Martin. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. All right. Ordinance, ordinance 2020-14 passes unanimously. Item 9D, Ordinance 2020-15, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to amend the leases for Vance Brand Municipal Airport hangar parcels as H7, H8, H9, and H10. Um, any questions, Council? Councilmember, uh, Councilmember Quintana, that does sound cool, doesn't it? Uh, uh, city Clerk Quintana, did we have any comments regarding on this matter? No comments were received on this matter, Mayor. All right, we'll go ahead and open and then subsequently close the public hearing on this matter then. Um, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Item 9E, Ordinance 2020-16, a bill for an ordinance office. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Was there a motion? Uh, let's make sure. Was there a motion? No. <laughs> uh, no passage. All right. Okay. I move passage. All right. Somebody so second. Or it's 2020-15. No, we should vote again. That's what we're now doing. that there's a motion. Okay. Ordinance 2020-15, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to amend leases for Vance Brand Municipal Airport hangar parcels known as H7, H8, H9, and H10. I seconded it. All in favor say aye. 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 All, opposed, all opposed say nay. 
Passes unanimously. Thank you, Council Member Martin. All right, Ordinance 2020-16, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Long Island to lease the real property known as Vance Brand Municipal Airport Hangar Parcel H68 to Four Dots LLC. Um, any questions or comments from Council? No. Ada, did you receive any public hearing comments? No, Mayor, no comments received on this item. All right, we'll go ahead and open and subsequently close the public hearing then. Do we have a motion? Councilman Martin? I move passage. Joan, do you want to second that? Sure, second. second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right, the pass is unanimously. Let's move on to item 11. We've already handled 11A, the COVID-19 emergency items for consideration. Let's move on to 11B, the 2020 legislative bills recommended for city council position. Ms. Cedar, are you around? I sure am, Mayor Bagley. So um, I am taking a look at these. These are the ones that should have been at your meeting on March 17th. There are two of them. And essentially, we're unclear what's going to happen with the legislature at this point. They have um, temporarily adjourned until today, and then they said they were going to do essential business. We would say that essential business will likely be things like the budget and things that have to pass in order to continue state operations. But just in case they pick these last couple ones up, I just thought I'd bring them for your official position. So the first one is House Bill 20, 1332, concerning prohibitions on discrimination in housing based on the source of income. Um, this bill basically adds discrimination based on source of income as a type of unfair housing practice. There are lots of different pieces in the bill um, and something that actually Council Member Waters pointed out a little earlier today is that there are some that will conflict with your inclusionary housing um, ordinance, but at the same time will actually afford uh, these folks more protection than your ordinance does today. And so in Kathy's opinion, it makes sense to support this, um, this bill, House Bill 20, 1332. The next one, which is Senate Bill 2189, is uh, concerning provisions that preempt a local government's authority to regulate the use of pesticides within local government jurisdiction. Um, the People for Pollinators group in Longmont asked me to bring this bill for your consideration. Um, it basically would give local control on the types of pesticides being used in parks and in, in cities, essentially gives local control for that. Our parks folks are kind of mixed about this, mostly because they're unsure as to whether every municipality has a whole lot of expertise in, in pesticides, uh, but the pollinators assure me that there's lots of information out there to be able to help folks. So um, staff doesn't have a recommendation for city council, but the people for pollinators are requesting the city council support Senate Bill 2189 due to the council support for environmental sustainability. can't hear you. Let's go with Councilor Christensen. Sorry, it's getting dark in here. Um, I think that um, I think that we should support uh, HB 20-1332 because uh, it is it is exactly partly what uh, Stanley Toll was talking about in that uh, Section 8 vouchers are not being accepted. And there are a number of things uh, why this is a good bill. And uh, I believe CML also supports it. Um, and I would also be in support of uh, Senate Bill 2189 on the pollinators. I don't really like state preemptions on anything. I think it should be uh, because these are almost invariably uh, set about by not by individuals or municipalities, but by special interest groups. Somehow I'm getting a lot of feedback. But anyway, um, so I, I would vote for uh, supporting that bill um, on local control over pesticides. But I do see what the city, uh, the city uh, workforce is, or the city parks is talking about in that uh, you don't want a patchwork of uh, state uh, regulations on pesticides. However, I, you know, it does seem to me that that would be a better thing to have 
uh, local control over. So, Paul, I just out of curiosity, are you moving that we actually follow staff's recommendation? Yes. Well, I'm on on um, the one concerning discrimination in housing based on source of income, and I would staff doesn't have a recommendation on the pollinators thing or the. Um, um, pesticides thing, but I would recommend that we support this. Is that a motion? Yes, I would move. I think we should do them both at different times. Do one and then do the other. Okay. So I move that we support HB 20, 1332 concerning prohibitions on discrimination in housing based on source of income. We have a second. Second. All right, Councilmember Martin. Um, yeah, uh, regarding source of the source of income bill, um, I would just like to say that I have uh, been in communication uh, with the city attorney regarding a local ordinance, and uh, I uh, have had it brought to my attention that Longmont should pass that local ordinance uh, about sources of income. Uh, so we'll be considering it if um, the state does not pass it. I think it would just be uh, in everybody's best interest that the state passes it and saves us the trouble. So I will vote for it. You're muted, Brian. There's a motion on the table by uh, Councilmember Christensen, seconded by Councilmember Martin, to support the uh, bill based on source or someone's income source. Uh, in favor, say aye. 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 All, all opposed, say nay. All right, the motion passes unanimously. Um, pollinator bill. I move that we support the pollinator bill. Second. Second. Dr. Waters. Was there a second to that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there was. Um, I, just a question for Sandy or somebody who may be closer to the bill. Given uh, going back to our discussions about fuma toxin and prairie dogs and what we could or couldn't do because of preemption of the state, does this lift that as well? Or is this narrowly just for pollinators? No. Councilmember Waters, Sandy Cedar, Assistant City Manager. That's a really good question. I actually don't know that answer. It did not come up as part of the staff um, taking a look at the bill either. But my guess is that it's probably either very similar. It, if it does anything, it would give us more control over that. Yeah, well, I, if, if it does, that would be a twofer, right? We would do yes. something good for our pollinators and create mm -hmm. some options for us or a whole different approach to what we could do on the issue of prairie dogs without having to try to create some kind of tricky disincentive or incentive to not use yeah. human toxin. So yes. I'm hope for this. Yes. All right, all in favor say, I'm oh, sorry, Councilor Martin. I, I would just like to also say that, uh, although I appreciate the staff's concern, that uh, there will still be state level regulations and so municipalities that do not feel they have the expertise to legislate on it could just abstain from doing so and be regulated by the state. So that's a, a good reason. I think that's a, uh, we should support it <laughs> there. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. All right. The motion passes unanimously. All right, Thanks, that, Mayor, this may be my last update. We'll see what happens with the legislature, but I'll certainly keep you informed. All right, we'll go ahead and skip. Final call, public invited to be heard as we read them all, I believe, unless you want to read them again. All right, <laughs> you won't do that. All right, Mayor and Council comments. Anybody have any? No? Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, we've been getting a couple of letters uh, from constituents that Hobby Lobby is not closing because they are uh, not they are not a non-essential uh, I'm sorry they are a non-essential business do we have any I guess this is a question for Eugene or Harry 
do we have any authority at all to uh, uh, in, make them comply? Um, so what I can tell you is that the um, the health departments are are working on that at a statewide level because it's not just Longmont, and, and so I know that CDPHE and the governor's office, and I believe the attorney general is engaged in that conversation. Thank you. I have one other comment, um, and it has to do with our air quality. Uh, if you go out to boulderair.com and look at our uh, air quality monitoring system, our VOCs are way, 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 way out of line. And since we have been staying inside, there's not as much traffic, uh, I am going to work with Dr. Detlef to find out why this air quality on the VOCs is so high and way past the EPA standards. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because we are, these affect lungs, people who have asthma, people have COPD, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I've had three or four phone calls from people wanting to know why they're so high. So just for the public, uh, I am going to be working with Dr. Le Detlev to see if he can get to some kind of resolution as to what's causing this. So thank you, that's it. All right, you're on. <laughs> Council Member Christians. Yeah, somehow I, you blank, your voice blanks out, Brian, which is hard to believe, but <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so I, I do have a little bit of information because I wrote to uh, Chief Butler today uh, concerning hobby, the Hobby Lobby uh, situation because of several emails I'd gotten and because of the, the uh, article in the Times call. Um, and it, here's what he said. We're aware of the circumstances involving Hobby Lobby. The state's attorney general's office is investigating these circumstances. In general, Boulder County Public Health is the county government agency that will be ensuring compliance with the governor's executive order enacted on March 25th. If and when the Boulder County Public Health Department cannot resolve any issue, they will call the local police department in the city in which there is an alleged violation. At that point in time, if the violation is in Longmont, Longmont police would be called by Boulder County Health to assist. Longmont police will respond to these cases. Um, anyway, uh, so that is, um, that is the communication I got from Chief Butler. Um, and I, I, I wanna thank everybody for everybody being patient with each other in these uh, strange circumstances of us trying to do these meetings online when our voices blank out and uh, you can't tell what's going on. <laughs> but anyway, I, I appreciate everybody's patience with each other. And uh, once again, we'll get through all this and um, it'll be all right. You know, we, there have been like 20 pandemics in the last 100 years. We, got, we get through them. But we need to stay inside so that this does not keep recurring and that we move it down the line. Okay? Everybody stay inside, wash your hands, fill out the census. You've got a lot of time on your hands, fill out the census. It's how we get representation and federal money. Everybody take care, stay with us. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I just would like to say I've seen an awful lot of cooperation, health, help, and generous spirit among our people. I've been um, trying to move information around online to help people um, get what they need or offer what they have to offer. And it's just been a wonderful experience. And I want to thank all the people of Longmont for really pitching in and uh, doing their part. So thank you, everybody. Anybody else? All right, I guess the only comment I have is uh, I heard um, the public comments. Uh, um, just make no mistake, I love this town, doing the best I can uh, and want to make sure that uh, we all get out of this in the back end. So that's all I'm trying to do. So, all right, with that, uh, Harold, anything? 
No comments, Mayor Council. Uh, Eugene is not on the line, correct? Eugene is on the line. All right, does he have any uh, comments? No comments, Mayor. All right, great. Uh, with that, we're adjourned.